In 1954, the Viet Minh defeated the French, ending 67 years of colonization. The country was partitioned. Ten years later, North Vietnam and the United States would be at war. In 1967, those of us who would later serve in Mac Phi Sot were given extensive training on the enemy we would fight in Vietnam. They were above all elusive, blending into the civilian population. Many were teenagers, masters of booby traps, never daring to face American firepower. They performed hit-and-run attacks, scavenging weapons from the battlefield. As we began to run SOG operations less than a year later, we discovered a very different enemy. There were no teenagers. They had more in common with what we had seen in World War II movies than what we had learned at Fort Bragg. The North Vietnamese were moving hundreds of tons of weapons and supplies over the Laotian infiltration routes. Well-armed and well-equipped, they stood their ground, backing up their infantry with heavy artillery and devastating any aircraft fire. In a complete role reversal, SOG became the guerrillas, planting mines and melding into the jungle after encounters, while the NVA swept the area, determined to drive us from their territory. So who was this enemy nobody had bothered to tell us about? Born after World War II, the North Vietnamese soldier is a farmer. 95% of the North's population are farmers. He grew up in the 1950s as the communists consolidated their power by arresting landowners and turning the farms into cooperatives. He is thoroughly indoctrinated in Marx's ideology and a member of a three-man cell, basically three people who spy on each other. But even with this scrutiny, he is immensely proud of his country. At age 16, he takes his place in the village militia, learning to fire weapons and participating in defensive drills. In 1965, he is told that the United States has invaded the South and is bombing the North. A couple of months later, he turns 18 and begins his mandatory military service. With the nation at war, his service is for the duration. NVA basic training is very conventional. Physical training and political indoctrination are robust. Orientation into military life and a very basic level of infantry combat are taught. Upon completion, in stark contrast to the United States Army, he is assigned to a combat support position, most likely in supply or maintenance. These assignments last between two and three years, at which time he is evaluated for his suitability to serve in the infantry. If he is selected, it is considered an honor, but not one that can be turned down. Infantry training lasts three months. Long road marches with heavy loads are interspersed with limited weapons practice and, of course, political indoctrination. The purpose is to get the soldier in physical shape for the long, difficult march to the battlefields in the south. Surprisingly missing is any jungle survival training. The three-man cell is still part of his daily life. However, for the NVA infantrymen, the three-man cell becomes much more than a method of control and discipline. Captured NVA soldiers with combat experience universally reported that knowing the cell was always together was good for morale and gave them confidence in battle. The North Vietnamese always operate in multiples of three. Shortly after infantry training ended, they were assigned to units keeping the three-man cells intact as much as possible and issued the equipment for their march south. You will find my book, Dawson's War, worthwhile. Rather than just accounts of Mac V. Sog's various missions, Dawson's War is the story of five men, three Americans and two Brew Mountain Yard mercenaries. I'll take you with us for a year. You'll get your fair share of gunfights in Laos, because we did. But Sog was so much more than gunfights. Sog was a brotherhood, and unless you experience the camaraderie we shared, you can't really know Sog. Through Dawson's War, these five men will become your friends. And like we do, you'll miss them when it's over. In the end, you'll be able to answer Sog's most asked question. What kind of men ran these dangerous missions? Get a copy today at Amazon. Thanks. By the end of 1967, when the flow of troops greatly increased, here is what they carried. 
They received the multi-purpose ground cloth slash poncho. It came in green, gray-green, and a not very effective camouflage pattern. It was more like the cheap nylon ground cover SOG operators carried than an American poncho. One pair of black pajamas and two sets of underwear, along with some personal care items. Two pairs of cotton fatigues. By then they were green rather than tan. Low-rise rubber sole footgear that were about the same quality as bata boots. A utility belt. Most had a brass hook buckle rather than the highly collectible star buckle that many soldiers painted red. A pith helmet with camouflage net that they put leafy branches in so they were harder to spot from the air. A large brim floppy hat that they preferred to wear into battle. SOG had similar headgear, but they cut the brim down. A cheap cotton backpack with high flaps that wasn't very serviceable. On the other hand, the hammock was well made with the detachable mosquito net. A rice bag, some were green, some were black. They often slung them over their shoulder and across their chest. A field dressing. The North Vietnamese suffered a chronic shortage of medical supplies throughout the war. The combination of their suicidal attacks on fixed positions and American air power saw to that. Before a battle, their agents would buy up every black market sanitary napkin they could get their hands on. Makes you wonder if a sudden shortage ever set off alarm bells. Probably not. A standard Chinese army canteen cup and cover. By now, the North Vietnamese were issuing AK-47s to all their infantry troops. Machine guns and rocket-propelled grenade launchers were issued at their destination. They got an AK-47 magazine chest rig with three magazines. Only the magazine and the rifle and one in the rig were loaded. The other two were empty. The Army had learned that the troops would leave loaded magazines at the rest stops to reduce weight. Some carried bayonets, but most had any one of a variety of utility knives. For their needs, a simple penknife was as good as anything. Finally, the piece of equipment they would use the most, a shovel. It didn't have a carrying case. They just stuck it through the flap on their backpack. With their equipment issued, the North Vietnamese soldiers' departure for the South was imminent. Knowing it would be a very long time, maybe years, before he would see his family again, many took this opportunity to make an unauthorized trip home. They would be quickly rounded up and returned. The NVA declined to call this AWOL or desertion, the numbers were too great and would have adversely affected troop strength. The offenders underwent some self-criticism and were returned to their unit as if nothing had happened. The unit is moved 300 miles from north of Hanoi, south to Vinh, then to Dong Hoi on buses and trains. For the last leg, they are trucked southwest on dirt roads until they enter the mountains. Here they disembark, cut leafy branches to camouflage their helmets, and their first guide starts them out on their trek. All their training had taken place in valleys and foothills. The mountain jungle is a hostile, foreboding place. They worry about snakes. They have no maps and no idea where they are. This is done on purpose in case they are captured. The infantry travels on trails in company-sized units. They exit North Vietnam less than 30 miles north of the DMZ, and move through the rugged mountains on direct routes to base areas that have been established in Laos. Heavier equipment, including artillery and ammunition, enter Laos a hundred miles further north and are trucked south on semi-improved roads much further west. After the day's march, they arrive at a camp with lean-tos and cadre. Food is prepared for them. The footing on their path is treacherous in places. Many will sprain or break their ankles. Some will get sick, mostly from malaria. Most rest stops have a rudimentary aid station. Injury or illness is something they all wish to avoid because it means they will be left behind to heal and lose the security of their cell. Each day they march between 5 and 10 miles. With the twists and turns and changes in elevation, this amounts to about half that distance on a map. Every fifth day they rest. It will take them more than a month to travel a hundred miles. 
By 1968, there were several NVA POW reports that read like this one from an interview with a captured 31-year-old first lieutenant. On our way south, we were in Laotian territory. We were told that our path was blocked by a helicopter troop landing, so we had to stay where we were for 10 days. The troops that landed could have only been from Mac Visag, and is evidence that their top secret activities were causing disruptions that even they weren't aware of at the time. Finally, they reached their destination base area. For the first couple of weeks, they rest, regaining their health and stamina lost on the long march. With assignment to a unit, training begins in earnest. Full loads of ammo, hand grenades, machine guns, and rocket-propelled grenade launchers are issued to the squads. Weapons platoons are formed and they learn to operate heavy weapons. They learn small unit tactics, firing positions, camouflage, and construction of defensive positions. A soldier in Laos will spend more time digging than doing anything else. Life in a base area is not demanding. The main threat is from random bombing, so he lives in a bunker, tunnel, or cave. During the heat of the day, there is a two-hour rest period. Political indoctrination takes place in the evening. The United States military had difficulty locating the NVA base camps, but a number of Laotian, Cambodian, Vietnamese, and Chinese merchants had no trouble. They set up crossroads markets where they sold everything from cigarettes to soap. Much of it was stolen from American logistics centers in South Vietnam. Although the North Vietnamese printed money for their soldiers to use on the trail, payments were only accepted in South Vietnamese piastres. Thousands of teenage women volunteered to serve in the youth shock brigades. They provided backbreaking labor on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and interaction with the troops was common. So common that after the war, they were shunned by the straight-laced society of the North. The North Vietnamese combat tempo was very slow. Multiples of battalion-sized units left their base area and ventured across the border, either to counter a South Vietnamese or American offensive, or to attack a fixed target, only one to three times per year. It was a very dangerous and frustrating undertaking. Most battles ended in their hasty withdrawal under air attack, forcing them to leave many of their dead and wounded behind. The primary focus of security in the base areas was to tend to overhead camouflage, ensuring that they could not be observed by enemy aircraft. Since 1966, small units of American ground forces from Mac Visag had been patrolling in Laos. These operations were considered too random and scattered to oppose effectively. Encounters with SOG troops had ended badly for the NVA because of SOG's ability to rapidly deploy attack aircraft. When a SOG team was inserted, the NVA would halt all troop movements in the area and wait for them to leave, only engaging if a SOG unit was about to discover a base area or supply facility. In the second half of 1967, the NVA greatly ramped up the introduction of supplies and manpower into Laos in order to support their upcoming siege of Quezon and the Tet Offensive. At the same time, there was an uptick in SOG operations. No longer able to afford the delays of just waiting them out, the NVA made a drastic change in their tactics. The result would be SOG's black year. In 1968, nearly half of SOG's operators would be killed. I'll talk about that next time.